Hi, good evening. This is Sir Hassan Dosani here. Welcome to the day four of our practice to pass session on SBL for September 2020. I hope you guys are keeping well tonight. Right, so as usual, let's wait for one more minute. Hi guys, can you hear me? Very good, thank you very much for the confirmation. very good thank you so let's wait for maximum one more minute as people are trying to join in and then we will start with tonight's session right so let's start so today's game plan all right so before i talk about today's game plan so those of you who are joining the session for the first time today a warm welcome and please note my whatsapp number okay and uh, please send me a whatsapp and i will add you to my global sbl whatsapp group and in case I'm not able to answer your question in tonight's webinar, you can always put your question on the WhatsApp group from where I will answer. OK. Right. So today's plan, as usual, we will first talk about exam technique on how to present your answer. Then we'll move uh, to topics. And today we will cover three important topics, which is risk management, project management, and internal controls. And during these three questions, we will be covering uh, some professional skills like commercial acumen, communication, and evaluation skill. As far as the formats are concerned, we will be covering section of the report, and more importantly, a project initiation document. So this is technique number four. So so far we have done three important techniques the first techniques was how to link your answers with the exhibits this was done in the first class in the second class we spoke about um, the number of points and maximum number of lines per mark and yesterday in the third class third webinar we spoke about time management techniques so today we will talk about how to present your answer, like your formats and your drafting and all those things. So the first thing is linking answer to exhibit is a must, okay? And uh, no general answers or definitions re required. So many students, they ask me, should we give a first, should we give a definition of the topic? Should we give an introduction about the topic? No need. 
because again i would remind you that always keep in mind that you are submitting your report to the board of directors okay and you will never you will never ever define a topic first in front of the board of directors okay they're expected to know what you're going to talk about okay then adopt paragraph style of writing okay bullet style should be avoided bullet style is casual but in a formal styling our answer should be in a paragraph form one paragraph should contain one point only so many times the examiner feels that students they try to squeeze several points under one paragraph so that one paragraph the size of that one paragraph is almost one page so can you imagine a paragraph of one page and why is it one page because people they put in several points in that one paragraph they just keep on writing and writing and writing no this is not how SPL works. One point, one paragraph. So if you're going, if you're going to write five points, I want to visually see five distinct paragraphs. Okay. And your paragraph should not be lengthy. What should be the size of the paragraph? Around four to six lines max. And we spoke about it um, on the second day, right? The size, number of points and the size of the paragraphs. So that means you need to give many small, small paragraphs. So if there are five points, five paragraphs. If you need to write eight points, I want to see eight paragraphs. And then leave one line between each paragraph. That's important from a visual point of view because you know the examiner, they need to check so many papers and this this applies to both manual students as as well as cbe students always leave one line between each pair it will open up your answer it will become visually easy for the examiner to follow through and check your answer he will not struggle so if you are a manual student, a paper student, then you leave one line between each pair and if you are a cbe student you once you complete a para, you press enter two times. How many times? You press enter two times. The first time you will press enter, it will give one, uh, it will go down. Second time you will press enter, it will go one step, one row more downwards, right? So it will leave one space in between. Focus a lot on the format required in the question. And you've seen that in, that in all our three days of a webinar, I was very, very particular and meticulous about the format. It does carry an impact on the examiner, okay? Look for stress words in the case, like very, extremely, significantly, and notably. So these are stress words. And if you've come across any stress word, when you are reading the exhibit, try and use that sentence in your answer. Because if the examiner is placing some importance, if the examiner is saying something like it is uh, competition is uh, there is significant competition. So he's actually putting a stress word. So you must never miss a point which carries a stress word. OK. And then lastly, use of models is not mandatory. And I've been, you know, talking about this ever since day one. So th we just need to know some basic models. And here is the list of basic models. And I will talk about this list in tomorrow's class as well. Any questions? Okay, let me first finish this uh, slide and then I will take questions. And then when you give recommendations, then mention the justification. So first of all, a recommendation should not be given until and unless the question asks you to give a recommendation. And in that scenario, when you are supposed to give a recommendation, then you also need to write a three-liner justification of why you are recommending what you are recommending. Okay? Sometimes one requirement asks for two things. So this is an interesting thing. Sometimes one requirement 
asks for two things. So in one sentence, the examiner is asking you for two things. For example, I've given a real example here. In one of the questions, the examiner said, So I can clearly see that in this one sentence, the examiner is very quietly or smartly or discreetly asking two things. Are you guys able to figure out what are the two things he wants in this question? Take five seconds, read, and then see whether you're able to identify that he's asking for one thing or two things. Yes, excellent. Role and value. Very good. So he's saying assess the role and value. So role has a different meaning and value has a different meaning. So if you remember yesterday's lecture, in, luckily we discussed non-executive directors yesterday, right? So role means what they do, they, they have four roles. One is strategy. Second is uh, um, I don't remember strategy and one was risk, one was people, and I think one was uh, nomination. No, sorry, guys, I can't remember of that. And what is the value? Value means the advantages. What are the advantages of having NEDs on the board? So you see, the examiner has very quietly asked for two things. So what you will do in such a case? He says like uh, eight marks. So I want you to give subheadings. I want you to first give a heading role. And you mention the four roles. And after that, you will give the heading value and then you will mention one two three or advantages okay so keep an eye on these kind of questions where the examiner innocently or quietly asks for two things under one sentence another example i have given is um, draft a memo which discusses the ethical and reputational concerns raised at the meeting so in in one reading it would seem like it's a one requirement but if you look closely you need to discuss ethical concerns raised at the meeting and you need to discuss reputational concerns so it's it's a thin line between these two but when you read the when you read this particular exhibit you will be able to identify that there are few ethical concerns and few are reputational concerns. So it's always better that you give subheadings. First, you will write ethical concerns and mention two or three ethical concerns. And then you go to reputational concerns subheading and mention two or three uh, reputational concerns. However, it doesn't mean that you have to mention exact number, same number of points between the two headings it all depends on the availability of information but at least give two subheadings so that the examiner clearly sees that you have addressed both the requirements and last example is prepare briefing note which assesses the role and benefits of integrated reporting ah we also did integrated reporting yesterday so role of integrated reporting and then followed by benefits okay and lastly if a question asks you for identify weakness and recommend improvement or identify risks and recommend mitigation factors then use tabular format i have been talking about it since yesterday so these are some very basic uh points on how you will present your answer okay now let me take some questions alia please uh, i think you missed the yes uh, the lectures before eight points for eight marks and i never please don't confuse other people
و اوکے سری ہرشا آج تا ویری انٹرسٹنگ پیشن سر وین آئی ایم رائٹنگ ایس بی ایل پیپر آئی ایم ہیونگ ہائی لیول آف کانفیڈنس دیٹ آئی ویل پاس بٹ وین آئی چیک دا آنسر وید مائی سجیسٹڈ آنسر آئی ایم گیٹنگ فورٹی ٹو فورٹی فائیو پرسینٹ So I believe that you are checking the, your answers from the suggested answers, uh, you know, provided by ACCA. If yes, then, you know, all, this, all the answers suggested or published by ACCA are not fit for examination conditions. Those are very, very ideal answers. And the examiner himself mentions many times that those answers are not expected under exam conditions. But the reason why they give such lengthy answers or such detailed answer is so that the students are able to see a variety of angles uh, so that their knowledge is, you know, uh, broadened. So if you are checking yourself, if you are checking your answer with the suggested thing uh, by the published answers by ACCA. I think if your answer matches 40% with the examiner's answer, you should be safe. Okay. All right. Another question. Asan is saying a lot of instructors say if you don't use model, you lose certain marks. Well, uh, let them say. They are talking theoretical or they are speaking bookish knowledge, uh, but that's not the case. If you read examiner's comments, the examiner says he's not interested in them. He likes models, but he doesn't want students to use model unnecessarily. So uh, try and just stick with basic models, okay? If it was a memo, we will use tabular format too. Yes, please. Even if it's a memo, you will use a tabular format. There is no harm in putting a table in a memo. Sir, it's ACC recommendation to use tabular format in weakness and recommendation. Yes, it is. Is there a handout for day five? Of course, there is a handout for day five, but I'm not going to share it. I will share it tomorrow because there is some interesting stuff in that. Uh, so I want people to attend the last day webinar so that they don't miss it. Won't writing bullets be more easier to read? Oh, yes. But again, will you write bullet points to the board of director and to the chairman? I've said hundred and thousand times, think like you are submitting your answer to the board of directors or to the chairman. So never, okay. Sometimes we forget the models. Models are necessary to pass. Please don't ask questions which I have answered several times. Models are not necessary in SBL. Okay, I think uh, many questions are from students who have not attended my uh, day one to day three webinars. Roles and responsibilities. That's probably the same things. <laughs> How can you ask questions from the tutor? There is a question box where you can uh, type again. No need for sorry. All right, guys. That's cool. Now let's move. Today we've got three big topics, okay? Right. The first one is risk management. Almost all the attempts has a question on risk management. So a very, very, very important topic. Now there are five possible questions which can come under risk management. Okay, I repeat, there are five types of questions or five possibilities of questions which may be asked under risk management. The first possibility is the question may ask you to identify the main risks which the organization is facing. So obviously there will be some information in the exhibits and then you will have to identify the main risks which are mentioned in that exhibit. Okay. So for you to identify, 
you must be familiar with various types of risks. So if you see this list, I've given a list of the most important possible risks. So in the exam, the examiner expects you to identify the risk and give a proper name to that risk. Okay. So for example, then this then it's important that you know remember this list and know the meaning of each of this uh, of the risks mentioned on this list. So that if you come across any of these risks while reading the exhibit, you can easily identify. So first of all, the most important is something called business risk. What's the meaning of business risk? Can anybody guess? Think, 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 business risk. Going concern, no, not impact on profitability. Strategy failing, yeah. So the, you mean, you know, just read it in reverse. Business risk means your entire business is at risk now. So something serious is going to happen. Uh, maybe the industry is become mature or is in declining phase. And uh, so something serious, which is affecting the entire business and which if it's, if it is not addressed, it may eventually lead to going concern. Strategic risk is also very similar, which means that your strategies are, can go wrong. And obviously if your core strategies goes wrong, Ultimately, it will affect your business and it will turn into a business risk. Financial risk, a very important one. It covers two things. Okay. Financial risk talks about uh, profitability. So, for example, if your revenues are falling and because of that, your profitability is going down and uh, or you're making consistent losses. That's a financial risk because consistent losses would eat up your cash, would eat up your capital and reserves, and eventually you will, you know, shut down. So financial risks. So if the company is struggling financially, which or you know, performance-wise, that's a profitability-wise, it's a financial risk. The second thing is, um, you know, capital structure, like. Uh, uh, equity versus debt or gearings, high gearings. So all the way the companies are structured, this also comes under financial risk. So being finance students, you must, you're expected to be very, very familiar with this word financial risk. But in simple terms, just remember, if you read that the company's revenue is going down, the profits are going down, it is a fine, it will, it will, it is a financial risk. Or if you see that now it's difficult to raise capital or it's difficult to raise arrange finance or debts or the, you know, gearing is going up again, it's a financial risk. Okay. Um, liquidity risk. We all know liquidity risk means that we do not have sufficient uh, cash to pay our current liabilities, right? Credit risks means that our customers are unable to pay their debts. We are unable to collect the receivables. That's credit risk and it's it's going to affect my cash flows, okay? Foreign exchange risk. This is applicable in a scenario when the company is either buying buying goods from foreign suppliers or suppliers based in other countries or if the company is selling goods to customers who are uh, you know from other countries so when there is a difference of currencies so it you are exposed to foreign currency risk and you, do you know how you can mitigate foreign currency risks Either you can take forward exchange covers or you can hedge or you, you know, deal with your basic currency. You just offer them 
uh, you know, deal uh, you do deal do the transaction in your home currency with those guys. Intellectual risks. Uh, it is mostly, you know, patents and innovation, uh, brand, all intangible, and your, you know, very key key staff leaving you and walking away with all the strategies and formulas and joining a competitor. It's all intellectual risks. Do I have any questions in these uh, six list before I move to the other ones? R&D, yes. R&D is intellectual. Brand is intellectual. Derivatives is uh, uh, foreign currency risk. Skilled staff, technical, yes, correct. Does having foreign subsidiary can lead to foreign currency risk? Very good question. Definitely yes. Sales depleting under which risk? Mohammed Shamil would tell me. I just explained very nicely. If your revenues are depleting, which risk will it go to? Financial risk. Okay, when your profitability or revenues is down, it's financial risk. Is there any difference between strategy risk and business risk? Yes, very small difference. Business risk is my business is at risk. Strategic risk is that my strategies may go wrong. And if your strategies go wrong, it will lead to business risk. Credit risk and liquidity risk are relatable. Yes, they are relatable. Intellectual risk, it is risks to your patents, research and development, innovations and key stuff loss of customers is business risk yes it's a business risk and it can also be a financial risk because loss of customers means loss of revenue do we have to give these headings while writing business risk huh? which headings business risk doesn't have any heading it's business risk itself is a heading how to mitigate business risk uh, it depends why your business is going down. Might be diversification, adding more products, adding more uh, uh, in industries, adding more geographies. Dishonesty, I will talk. Operational risk, yeah, it's there. So I have not given the list of everything. Since I mean, now let's talk. Let's talk about this one. Political risk mainly means that the government is not stable. The political situation of the country is not stable. Legal and compliance risk means that there are a lot of laws. They are continuously changing and there's a complex legal system and there's a risk that you might not be able to comply with all the risks and end up giving fines or reputational issues. Okay, legal and compliance. Environmental risk, risk to the natural environment like spillage and pollution you're causing damage to the environment reputation risk very very important this is a risk which can cause damage to your brand or reputation or goodwill health and safety risk means that it this is a you know there is a possible bodily injury or death to to your employees or to your customers or suppliers or society around you. So any bodily, bodily threat is health and safety. Technology risk is that if you are dependent on certain technologies and if that technology becomes redundant, uh, then you, you face that risk. Okay, so they are, most of them are self-explanatory if you read them in reverse. If you focus on them, you would be definitely able to identify what it means. However, in the exam, you are expected to use these words. When the examiner says identify main risk, please use these words. Okay. That's okay. So, so the most common type of question is identify main risk. And then it is also followed by give recommendations. So obviously, if you have identified a particular risk, then you must be able to suggest mitigation strategies. Okay, how do you do it? You just, you know, can read the risk carefully and reverse it. 
to arrive at the recommendation. Sometimes it will work, sometimes it will not work. Sometimes you might need a common sense uh, or sometimes the case will provide, provide you some information why that particular risk is happening. So if you can just you know, uh, cover the reasons and reverse it, you will come up with a recommendation by default. Let me check for questions. Legal and compliance. I mean, what's your question, uh, Wane? Do we need to write risk heading like business risk, credit risk in exam? It's good if you can write heading. I'm always in favor of small, small headings. Environmental risk could cause reputational risk, 100% yes. It can cause reputational risk. It can cause, uh, uh, you know, even business uh, business risk because if it's something big, uh, you're going to lose your license. If the economy is going down under which risk? Financial risk or business risk. There's a very thin line between business risk and financial risk, okay? Won't a tabular format seem less professional? No, please. Please follow the tabular format. How is it uh, less professional? Operational risk is also there. I have not included in the list. There are 50 more risks uh, out there in the world, but I have just given you the most important ones or the most the risk which have been used um, uh, many times by the examiner. That could be overlapping pine points here. Absolutely, yes. I will give you a recommendation example. Just wait. We will do a proper question. Yes, Yogesh, you are right. Total three marks. You remember yesterday? So if you are if you are supposed to, if we get a question on risk plus recommendation, then we divide by three, right? To arrive at the number of points. So it's total three marks for one risk and one recommendation. Can you explain probity risk? Probity risk is uh, dishonesty, uh, dishonest employees, employees doing fraud, or taking giving bribes or taking kickbacks this is probity risk is in fraudulent activities by your employees probity risk okay please ask questions relating to this slide only thank you Jeanette right so let's um, move on another question is which the examiner can ask is why risk varies company to company okay so my listen to my question my question to you is does each and every company follow faces the same level or same type of risks or does the level of risk varies from company to company. Think about it. 10 seconds. Does all company faces exactly same type of risks or does the risks varies from company to company? Yes, very good. Very good, guys. You are saying it could vary. You sure? It varies, yeah. All the companies cannot have identical risks. So now, what are the reasons why company risk varies between company to company? What would be the reason? Do you think the size of the company matters? Do you think the geographical location of the company matters? Yes. Not all companies are of same size. Not all companies are located in the same city or the same country or the same region. Do you think growth phase of the company matters? Like some companies may be in a startup phase. Some companies are already very established. 
and some are in declining phase so it also depends on the growth phase of the company then you think business model or strategies also matter of course every company have different business model or different strategies some are physical business some are online some are following a, a hybrid model so also you know risk will differ between the companies and then also the financing structure like how much capital how much equity sorry how much loan what's the gearing so because not because companies organizations are not identical that is why the risks are also not identical so what was the topic guys why risk varies from company to company you must remember these five reasons because they pay it because it depends on the size the location the growth phase the business strategies or models and the financing structure any questions yes very good easy today i feel you guys are more smarter you guys are getting smarter day by day very good now similarly do you think all industry they face exactly same risks or the risk varies between industry and industry for example a, a banking sector banking sector versus oil and gas sector do they these are two very broad industries banking and oil and gas do they face exactly the same risks or risk will vary from industry to industry think imagine bank banking sector compared with oil and gas sector their risks are completely different so risk varies from industry to industry as well and what could be the reasons because the nature of products are different it could be a financial industry versus a manufacturing industry the level of investment can differ the level of regulations some industries are highly regulated some industries are less regulated that is why you know the legal and compliance risk will vary from industry to industry ecological aspects uh, oil and gas has a lot of ecological impact so there are more considerations Ecolo environmental risks will be very high in oil and gas technological aspects firms like high-tech firms like facebook and uh, amazon uh, who are heavily dependent on technology they face technology risks so very easy topic but in the exam somehow the students they get confused so just ask a very simple question in your mind does every company faces the same risk no right so and automatically things will start coming into your head let me see any questions tesla what will be the type of question um the examiner the question will simply say uh, how why uh, the risks in this particular industry is higher than other industries. Okay, so you will say the risk in our industry is higher as compared to other industries because of da 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 da. You will look at ecological impacts, technological, ecological, regulatory investments, and the nature of product. Now, risk diversification. So one of the ways uh, where you can mitigate your risk is diversification. Don't put all eggs in one basket. So diversification means spreading. Okay, spread your risk, diversify. Now, whenever we talk about diversification, there are three levels of diversification. How much? three levels of diversification how much three levels of diversification you should never forget it now the first level of diversification is product diversification that you add more products you remain in the same industry but you add more products so for example i'm a 
uh, I'm a restaurant and uh, I'm selling fast food and then I diversify at a product level. I start selling bakery items or uh, proper food as well and juices as well. So I'm adding more stuff to my menu. That's product diversification. The next level of diversification is called industry diversification, where you actually move into diversify into other industries. You are not reliant, depending or dependent on one industry. So you can diversify into something related or you can diversify into come something completely new and unrelated to your existing business. So if I'm a restaurant, I can diversify I, and I open uh, coffee houses. Okay. Or I can diversify and I can open uh, a school. Or I can diversify or open up a maternity hospital. It's all diversification. Some of it, some of it is related. Some of it might be unrelated. But the third possible diversification is geographical diversification. That you should not concentrate in any one city or any one country or any one region. Normally, if you concentrate in one country, if the economy of the country goes down, you are screwed. If the political situation of the country goes down, you are screwed. Right. For example, last week, uh, this very, very sad incident happened in Lebanon. There was such a huge blast in Lebanon that the more than half the city was just destroyed. OK, so if you are a, you had a business in Lebanon, it was your end. So if you know the way you can diversify a geographical diversification helps you to spread your country risks currency risk economic risks political risks okay so whenever you see a question on diversification immediately remember that there are three types of diversification you can diversify based on product you can diversify based on industry and you can diversify based on location let me check for questions product diversification is a related diversification yes i is I, yes i think you're right is industry diverse diversification same as market diversification <laughs> yeah okay if you think if you say so unrelated like a conglomerate yes absolutely correct Unrelated diversification is more risky. Absolutely correct. Does market diversification and geographical diversification same? Okay. See, uh, market diversification is a word which is used for both industry diversification and it is also used uh, as a word which is also used for geographical diversification so market diversification is a broad terminology includes both industry and geographical diversification best part of being a CFO, excuse me <laughs> best part of being a cfo fat bonuses okay uh, conglomerate conglomerate means google please can we use growth vector model to for these diversification explanation excuse me mr admin can you shoot this guy i've been shouting my lungs that please stay away from models and you are bringing such a stupid model please stay away <laughs> okay don't take me seriously okay uh, all right guys uh, move on i'm glad today you guys are uh, it's not a diff it's not an easy topic so i'm glad today you guys are uh, following following uh, you know understanding stuff very nicely all right last two things risk mitigation strategy so the examiner may ask you please advise steps how the organization can mitigate risks so uh, you know all these good organizations the bigger organizations the multinationals 
they focus a lot on risks and then risk management how do they do risk management the first and foremost they want to create a culture of risk management they say that risk management is not a task it is a mindset so they want that all the employees whatever work they do whatever decisions they take they keep risk management in all their in their mind and in the consent in the considerations okay so they create a organization wide culture of risk management then they adopt a risk management framework okay just like there is i inter uh, you know financial reporting framework there are all for risk management there are also uh, lots of frameworks and the most famous and commonly used framework for risk management is called coso's enterprise risk management framework it's called scosos erm so all organizations who wants to adopt proper risk management strategies they adopt coso's erm framework and then they can you know the next thing they do is they adopt risk management strategies uh, which is tara framework we will cover tara no we will not cover tara framework but uh, tara framework do you know tara framework T for transfer, uh, avoid, uh, reduce, and uh, 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 transfer, avoid, reduce, and something I don't remember. Risk committees. There must be, uh, you know, good companies have risk committees, especially the listed companies, it's mandatory. Then the larger companies will have risk managers and, you know, they will have regular risk audits. So just remember these few steps, which are important if the question says risk mitigation strategies can include what things. Ah, Tara is transfer, avoid, reduce, or accept. Thank you so much. COSO for internal control and risk are same. Uh, Alia COSO uh, covers both things. There are, you know, two broad modules in it. There is a COSO for risk management and COSO for internal controls as well because internal controls is part and parcel of risk management okay yes do we need to go through COSO's ERM framework no please what is a framework <laughs> I am sorry I should have explained what is a framework a framework I framework is some guidelines okay so like IFRS are proper authentic globally accepted guidelines right so ifrs is a accounting reporting framework similarly there are proper framework framework proper guidelines for risk management as well heat maps uh, heat map i would have explained but in cbe after cbe i don't expect heat maps to go to you know to come in the exam because you need to draw heat maps and you can't draw heat maps on for an Excel. Right, so the first and foremost embed in the culture of the organization. So how do you embed something in the culture of the organization? This could come uh, in the exam that the company wants to embed or introduce risk management in the culture so the first thing is commitment from top management so whatever anything which is which you need to create the culture for it has to come top down so commitment from top management you have a formal risk committee you adopt erm framework a lot of training for employees at the time of orientation uh, include in their job descriptions rewards so all these activities will collectively slowly and gradually start uh, creating a culture of risk management in the organization okay last thing 
advantage of having a separate risk committee. So we had discussed this yesterday that having a separate risk committee has its own advantages. For example, it is more specialized, it is more focused, it can spend more time as compared to the full board. The full board can focus more on strategic issues and having separate committee means higher involvement of NEDs and improves the confidence of the shareholders. Let me go through some questions. Can we include risk register and risk policies in risk culture? Yeah. Anything which can encourage the environment of risk, anything which can in increase the importance of risk management, you can include. Sir, we haven't covered presentation slides. Yes, we will do a question on that tomorrow. uh pavitra it is pdf annotator pdf annotator software <laughs> surprise disclose no 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 tomorrow okay i'll disclose the surprise tomorrow the main thing is i will disclose the list of important topics list of practice questions and most important i will discuss some dangerous technical articles which were published a couple of months back and i expect a uh, proper question on those and those dangerous technical articles are called blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies okay so we'll talk about it tomorrow all right so we've done this whenever you see a question on risk try and give a tabular format assume three marks for one risk and if they say identify the risk, give the impact and then recommend. In, in this case, you will create three columns and then you will create, assume four marks for one point. Okay. One point means one risk followed by the impact and the recommendation. Right. So let's do one question. Our speed is a little bit slow, so I need to pick up. Exam question practice number six topic is risk management. SBL specimen number one. DCS question number two A. I think we did this question yesterday. Uh, DCS. Is this DCS? Yeah. Two A. So let me open two A. Hmm. In the October board report, the executive directors refer to a number of factors affecting DCS and the need to choose one of the two alternative strategic options. You now need to do the following. Required, draft a section of the report to identify and discuss three main risks which dcs company currently faces okay identify three risks plot them on a heat map and then recommend appropriate strategies to manage those risks using an appropriate risk management framework so a risk management framework is tara transfer accept reduce or avoid so you know we can there are four possible things we can do with a risk either we try to reduce it or we try to avoid it altogether or we try to accept it which means we just do nothing we accept it as we go along or we try to transfer it to someone like outsourcing or insurance or something transfer the risk to someone else so let's look at the october report and try to identify three main risks october report is here 
so you don't need to read the whole report i'll just tell you where so do you see this uh this thing this heading just risk and opportunities what are the so this is a in it is a october it's a report by Jules, marketing director to the board okay so you are reading this report and it says what are the specific risks and opportunities which affect dcs ability to create value blah 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 blah, blah. so what are the specific risks and opportunities so we will just read okay guys you guys read this three paragraph let me uh, enlarge it Okay. Now, can you guys read this uh, from here to here and see if you are able to identify three risks? Okay, I give you two minutes. Time starts now. I do understand that you haven't read the background, so I will help you with that. But first, read and then I'll explain. One more minute. right so were you able to identify the main risk which this company is facing so for example just let me give a quick background that this company has two products okay the first product is called data communication component and uh, this product contributes 65 percent to my total revenue okay and what's happening to this the in the international market for data communication component started to saturate and decline doesn't sound sound good to me and this is a product which contributes 65 percent to my revenue and the remaining 35 percent of the revenue comes from another product which is called supply and support of contracts so th this product is also facing some issues we are now finding it increasingly difficult and costly to maintain the required level of network support it is harder to getting harder to recruit high caliber staff the headquarters 
is on a location which is unattractive for key personnel to relocate. So all these things is making life miserable for the second product as well. So if, if your company has two products and both of them are going through a very, very difficult situation, which risks will you take this to? It's business risk. Now, I think these, these are such big risks that if you don't do anything, it will eventually lead to a going concern. So I would say business risk. Okay, it could it could be a strategy risk, but I think it's more of a business risk. Now you are in a wrong industry altogether. Your industry is mature. It's declining. Okay, so I would say the number one risk is business risk and you will copy paste. Um, you know, you will mention all these all these arguments there. But obviously not in a lot of detail because what's the marks? Did anybody see the marks? Six plus two, eight. Eight divided by three. Hmm, how much is this? Eight divided by three. So we need to give three points, three risks. Okay. So how do you mitigate this risk? The only way you can mitigate this risk is diversification, right? You add more products, you change industry, you do a geographical diversification. Remember three levels of diversification. Diversification is a tool through which you mitigate risks or you spread your risk. So if your current products are mature, you innovate and come up with new products. If your location is a problem, you do a geographical diversification, okay? I'm not going to solve it, but do you understand the concept? I already answered business risk versus strategic risk in the start. Very good. Now, what's the second risk? Banks are now tightening their credit lines and uh, placing covenants on us to keep financial gearing. So this one is affecting my <coughs> sources of financing sources of funding what do we do which risk financial risk apps no it's not liquidity risk Anna liquidity risk means that your current assets or your cash is unable to pay your current liabilities liquidity risk is day-to-day -day cash okay this is financial risk. So who's saying credit risk? Harris, my friend. Credit risk means your customers are not paying their invoices. Okay, this is your bank. This is your lender. So it's financial risk. And how do you solve it? If your debt financing is not there, what are the other options? And it's mentioned here. Uh, it is unlikely that any future growth or investment can be financed from further debt and we would need to use our considerable cash reserves or utilize internally generated funds or they can you know uh, raise uh, equity based financing like ordinary shares or right issues okay so mitigation factors are already given to you in the scenario. Uh, let me look at questions. Equity financing, better working capital, reserves, using your cash reserves. Mm, Shilpa, very good. I don't want to. You are confused between financial and liquidity risk. Oh my God. Liquidity risk is day to day cash, my friend. Current assets being used to pay your current uh, receivable assets like debtors and cash being used to pay your current liabilities like accounts payable. But a financial risk is something much bigger. Financial risk means you are 
either into continuous losses, you are losing revenues and profitabilities, your business will eventually end up in going concern, you are not able to raise capital or raise big finances for projects. Financial risk is much, much bigger than liquidity risk, okay? Liquidity risk pertains to working capital? Yes, you can say that. Framework used like Tara framework? Yes, so we will say that we can... Uh, actually, you know, this is a specimen paper, so the nature of the questions are not very good. So the framework we were supposed to use is Tara framework. So... So we are if we are facing financial risks here so we are trying to reduce the risk okay by we're looking at equity financing we are not trying to transfer the risk we are not trying to uh, avoid the risk altogether we're not trying to accept or do nothing we're trying to reduce this risk so reducing is one of the strategies of the tara model same goes for this thing okay so do not confuse with uh, Tara model here. It's not a nice question to apply Tara model. So we were supposed to give three risks. So I need one more risk. I'm struggling to find a risk from here. Can anybody help me out? One more risk. Intellectual risk. Okay. Human resource risk. The location strategy risk, technological risk, okay. So, uh, I think intellectual risk is better because they are finding, uh, finding it hard to find, you know, the right technical people. So, technical people uh, whom your business is highly dependent on can fit under intellectual thing, okay maybe geographical risk uh, not really geographical risk is something at a country level they are saying that you know their location like in you know their area or where their office is located where their headquarters is located that area is not good supply chain risk i don't know how you can link this with the case what will be the recommendation of intellectual risk? So we will look at the reason why this risk is there. The, the, uh, we are facing intellectual risk. We are facing why we are unable to recruit good people is because of our headquarters location. So we must try and change and move to a location where we are able to attract good technical resources or we try and set up work from home or an online setup where physical location doesn't matter and employees can work from home. All right, enough. Otherwise, in this question, if you read some other exhibit, there's a big risk on environmental factors, okay? Carbon footprint and this and that. So if you don't come, if you can't think of uh, any third risk, you can always uh, mention environmental risk. It is not from this exhibit, it's from another exhibit. But if you are struggling, you can always use any ex, uh, uh, you know, information from other exhibit and you will get marks. Okay. Now, do you guys need a break now or we do uh, project management? Mm, or let I have an idea. Wait. Project management is a, is a big topic. Uh, um, you need to be a little fresh on that. So let's do project management after the break. Okay, let's do the third topic first. Internal controls. It's a very small and a very interesting topic and it will be done in a start while. Just give me a second. I'll just have a glass of water, please.
right internal control systems so do you know what is internal control system there's a stupid definition you can you know let me go through it but i'll explain to you in layman terms but let's first read the definition okay. an internal control system comprises the whole network of systems established in an organization to provide a reasonable assurance that organizational objectives will be achieved and the assets will be safeguarded okay let me try and explain uh, using a simple diagram right so do you know that all organizations they face risks okay if you open up a company it faces certain risks so how do you protect yourself from risk you do you have to do risk management okay because you face risks you do risk management now what is risk management that you manage you try and manage the risk so that either the risk they do not uh, incur or happen or in case the risk happens it is mitigated or reduced to a tolerable manageable level so because we face risk we need to do risk management one of the most important way of risk management is to have proper internal controls so then internal control means that you have a proper system proper process of each and every activity and because you everybody follows a, a particular system or a process internal controls they help to minimize or mitigate the risks understand so how do we make sure that internal controls are working properly we have internal audit function so the its job of internal audit to make sure that internal controls are working properly and how do we know that internal audit is working properly there is audit committee which oversees the performance of internal audit so this is a simple chain from top to bottom it all starts from risks how do we you know what do we do about risks we implement risk management strategies uh, one of the most important component of risk management is internal controls how do we know internal controls are working what how do you know directors get any assurance so there is an internal audit and how do we know internal audit is functioning there is its audit committee so here now you understand the role of internal controls these are a whole set of systems controls and processes through which we make sure that everything is happening in a proper manner and one of the core purpose of internal control is to uh, minimize the risks so now what is the purpose or importance or advantage whatever you want to call of internal control not simple it helps in achieving the organization's objective orderly and effective conduct of business forget about the, the difficult ones it mitigates the risks safeguarding of assets ensures that the completeness that the accounting records are accurate and complete effective financial reporting prevention of fraud compliance with laws proper reliable information for decision making so all these are the advantages of internal controls or all these are the objective or purpose of internal controls and all these are also 
the importance of internal controls okay now what kind of questions is in the exam so first of all let me tell you that every sbl attempt there has been a question on internal controls however the questions were more practical they were not like this theoretical bookish definitions or advantages all the questions to date are very very practical very interesting you don't need to know any chapter you don't need to know any topic or syllabus or model to answer these kind of questions okay so we'll do a question right now uh, but before that again the same thing whenever you see a question on internal control weaknesses and recommendation table format divide by three and if it says identify the weakness discuss the impact and give recommendation then divide by four Sub sbl september 2018 question number three b September 2018, I have to go back. September, okay, strategic, d -d 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 -d. September, no, this one, September 2018. And we need to read the question 3B. This is not September, my friend. September. Can you guys see September come? On. Sorry guys, I'm not able to see September 2018, even though it's assigned. Are you able to see on my screen somewhere? Oh, refresh, yes, yes. Yes, yes, good idea, thank you guys, let me refresh. Yeah, it works now, thank you so much. I'm a bit off today. It seems September 2018. Thank you so much. Hmm. Question 3B. I go to question 3 and I pick up 3B. Huh? So it says prepare like a summary of for CC's board to review assessing the control weaknesses discussed at the emergency meeting, stating for each control its consequence and recommendations for improvement. Three things. It wants you to talk about weaknesses, uh, stating the consequence of that weakness, followed by recommendation 14 marks and then professional marks for evaluation skills by basing explanations of significant control weaknesses on the information 
provided and recommending appropriate improvement. So in evaluation skill, they have defined what exactly they want you to do. So you need to give a balanced pros and cons. So when we talk about weakness, that's a con, but when we talk about a recommendation, that's a pro, so it will be a balanced thing. 14 plus 4, 18 marks. So if I divide 18 by 3, let's say, for example, 18 divided by 3, 6 weaknesses. And if I divide 18 divided by 4, 4.5. So between 5 and 6 weaknesses we need to mention. It all depends on the exhibit. Okay. Now let's go through the exhibit. This is a exhibit for transcript of emergency meeting. This one. All right, guys, um, this is a transcript of a meeting. Present is Burton, who is the chief executive, Imena, who is the chairman, Alan is the risk manager, and Pat is the consultant. Actually, your role in this question is Pat. You are Pat, okay? The meeting began at 10 a.m. Burton open the meeting by playing the following clip from Beatles news program about the break-in from earlier morning. There was a break-in. Do so you remember this question, Beatle? I think we did this question, right? So this was this company, Cofold Construction, which is building, which is building the largest road in a neighboring country called Beatle. Presenter. Two protesters were seriously injured last night after they broke into one of the construction sites for the new road through the high mountain. So, bad thing, huh? two protesters were seriously injured because they broke into our construction site. The break-in is an escalation. Why did they break in? It's an escalation of the recent protest against the new role. Protesters have been unhappy that they have not been able to meet with Burton, the chief executive. That's just a background, okay? There's no, no weakness there. Now, let's come here where the weakness is. Burton. I thought that showing the news report was the best way to brief you on what happened, although Alan had found out more since. Alan, I've spoken to our employees and the staff from Solin Security, the security firm in Beetle, which we use. It seems that they both went to deal with the protesters at the main entrance. Imena. Were there only two security staff on site? Yes, the contract only states that the security post should be manned at all times. Interesting. So I think that the protesters were able to break in because we just have two security guards. I just shaded it. Let's Imena. The news report mentioned an attempt break-in last week. Were we told about it? Alan, the security staff said that they reported it to their managers, but no one from Sholin Security appears to have contacted us. Strange. So there was a break-in attempt last week as well, but the management was never informed. Isn't that a weakness? What do you think? Yeah, good. What more do we know about what happened once the protesters got in? The protester who was injured 
ran across an unlit service road and the van collided with him. Seriously? My God. So there was a protester who was running inside our construction site and there was a dark unlit road and the van collided with him. Oh my God. Oof. What's the weakness here? You see the weakness? Okay. Should the area have been lit better? This is chairman. Huh? So Alan is saying apparently lighting was one of the things picked up by key by Lee Kurata, our health and safety manager, when he visited the site two months ago. Staff said that the lighting was going to be fixed before internal audit visit plan for next month. So lighting was an issue which was already reported in the health and safety manager's report two months back. And even after two months, the lights have not been fixed and they are saying that we will fix it next month before internal audits visit. Wow. So why isn't Lee here? Who's Lee? Oh, Lee is the health and safety manager. Lee's been off sick for last six weeks. We will have to get a temporary replacement and now to fill the gap caused by Lee's absence. So the health and safety manager is absent for last six weeks and nobody is, you know, working in his position. Did Lee submit his report on the site before he went sick? Button. I did receive, but the points were generally minor. We've had so much else to discuss at the board meetings recently that I haven't had a chance to report on health and safety. Okay. So this is a point which is supposed to be taken uh, under uh, advantages of having a separate risk committee. Okay. So leave it here. What more do we know about the protester who collided with the van? I haven't spoken to the driver yet, but I have spoken to the security guard who chased the protester. He didn't see the collision, only the aftermath. How about the protester who claimed to have seen his friend being run over? I'm not sure whether he would have been able to see clearly what happened as the lighting was so poor. He also, he had also fallen over a patch of oil, <laughs> which hadn't been mopped up. This was why the guard was able to catch him. Oh my God. So the other protester, he also fell over a patch of oil, which wasn't mopped up. Yep, you told me earlier, Burton, that our lawyers... All right, done. So you know the rest of the material is for some other questions. So guys, are you able to identify weaknesses from this interview? So what's the first weakness? Insufficient number of security staff. Do you agree? What's the first weakness? Yes. Insufficient number of insufficient security staff or insufficient number of security staff or you can say only two security staff on site okay so how about the format this is question number 3b so let me go to 3b So I'd already done this with a little while, you know, when I was practicing myself. So the format would be, I would like to have three columns, weakness, consequence, recommendation, because all these three are required in your tasks. So what's the weakness? There were only two security staff on site. So what's the consequence? 
what happened what can go wrong if there are only two guards so i just simply said protesters were able to break in from the other entry points as there was insufficient number of guards you can also say unauthorized uh, people can enter our project construction site there could be theft or there could be malicious intents okay whatever you think can be the consequence what do you recommend now what is your recommendation let's think any recommendation how do you fix this weakness increase in the number of security guards very good desire very good it's simply whatever is the weakness turn it around turn it around and it becomes the recommendation i repeat whatever is the weakness turn it around and it becomes the recommendation insufficient number of security guard what will be the recommendation they should have sufficient number of or they should have number of guards which is sufficient enough to guard all the entry points and the entire construction site in a reasonable and safe manner can we suggest change of security company no no shilpa because if you bring another company they will also give you two guards because the contract says two guards it is your decision so the root cause is not the security company the root cause is that you have been stupid and you just told them you need two guards so you actually need to increase the number of guards okay of course can we revise the terms yes we will but what will you revise what will you tell them so just come to the point increase the number of guards forget about revise the contract this and that first you give the main thing that you increase the number of guards Halas. okay okay what's the weakness number two The security staff said that they had reported it. Oh, there was some break in last week. Uh, yeah, sorry, this is not highlighted, you know, but this was break in last week. Uh, but uh, the cofold management was not informed. So, what is the weakness here? Attempted break-in of last week was not informed to CC's management. Fine. So the security company uh, was not did not inform us. That's the weakness. What can go wrong? What is the consequence if management is not informed of any bad or abnormal safety security situation? So consequences, CC is unaware of any security breaches and hence were not able to take preventive actions. Had they knew last week, had they were they would have they would have been informed last week, they might have increased the security now, right? And then what do you recommend? That the security company should be strictly instructed that any security breach should immediately be brought to the attention of cc's management simple no long stories no going left no going right just focus on the meat some core words some basic common sense point and move on do you understand the approach yes shilpa you are right okay so what else two down three weaknesses more to go so unlit service okay and now i'm i'm speeding up i'm not going to details unlit service road for improper lighting consequence 
it can lead to health and accidents and health and safety issues of the employees or any you know customers or public and what do you recommend that all the entire project site should be sufficiently lighted so that uh, any accident can be avoided simple and then this weakness that this insufficient lighting was reported two months ago but they have not done anything in fact they were waiting for one more month what's the consequence if you do not implement the the recommendations quickly they will lead to more and more accidents and uh, you know reputational issues uh, what do you recommend that uh, all health and safety related reports should be immediately addressed and implemented and not and uh, there should no not be delayed now lee has been sick for sick for last 6 weeks uh, he or she, I don't know, is not reporting uh, uh, at work for last six weeks, and nobody's doing their their job. What's the consequence? The consequence would be that there's no health and safety manager available, so any health and safety issues will be unaddressed. Recommendation that until Lee is uh, returns back, there should be the health and safety, the role of health and safety manager should be delegated or substituted to some other appropriate person. And what about this oil patch? Didn't mop up, he slipped, he fell. So understand? So now I have a question. Which syllabus or model or topic is required here to answer this type of a question other than common sense yeah yeah internal control is the topic tara come on who said tara when did we where did i use tara in this question erm which oh come on which chapter you read were you able to do this question without reading any technical thing it was just a common sense thing to identify a weakness less security guards less lighting oil spillages all these things just common sense okay so and i can see it's not very common right so the good news is that this kind of question is almost there in every attempt and i feel that these are high scoring questions and a little bit of time saving questions because it's you know you just quickly identify some risks some consequences and a quick recommendation but at least if even if it's not time saving it is high scoring because it's just common sense okay so i hope that also in your attempt this kind of question comes and look at the marks 14 plus 4 18 marks for such a question and it's and it's a real paper right huh? it's a september attempt paper it's not a specimen paper so 18 marks is uh you know if i score like at least 12 marks why it would be awesome all right, do I have any questions before we go for a break? So did we apply evaluation skill? Indirectly, yes, not in proper sense. Evaluation means, skill means giving a balanced view to the thing, right? The balanced view to the board. So we are talking about weaknesses, then we talked about consequences, and we talked about recommendations. So that's a complete holistic balanced view right so in in that sense yes we did achieve uh, evaluation skill mohammed shamil uh, good one yes you can but it's too long too lengthy 
how will you do referencing of this type of question? This is a one-to-one -one exhibit. Did you attend yesterday's lecture where I said one-to-one -one exhibit and one-to-many? No, no, sorry. This is not a one-to-one. -one. It is a transcript. But there are... So you just mark and you just write question number 3B. You just write 3B up in front of all the weaknesses. That's it. And then or you can copy paste all the weaknesses under your in your Microsoft uh, M, you know, word processor. Right. So let's take a break. And after that, we will do a heavy duty topic called, uh, you know, called project management. It is 10 past uh, 10 minutes past 10. So hang on. So let's meet at 10 20 p.m. Okay. Uh, my pen is not working, so I'm not able to write here. 10, 10 to 10, 20, is it 10, 10? 10, 25, 15 minutes break. And then we start sharp for project management. See you guys in a bit.
Right, guys, welcome back after the break. So our last topic for tonight is project management. Slightly difficult topic. And it is also one of the important, important topics for September attack. So first of all, what is a project? So a project is a one of special activity which is other than the organization's usual day-to-day -day operations or business okay so just remember project is a one of non-routine activity which is not part of day-to-day -day operations so project is done for something specific for example let's say a company wants to uh, expand and they are building another factory so the construction of another factory is a project because it is a one of one of special activity which is not part of the their routine day to day operations similarly if you talk about online that the company wants to set up a, a web page and set up an online e-commerce system and it already exists uh, in physical space so that is also a project whereby they are trying to set up everything which is required for a online trading platform similarly when you implement a new system or a new erp that implementation is also a project so anything which is one of special activity is project okay now why is project important what things we need to consider why are we doing or talking about projects so you know projects generally are uh, expensive they involve uh, big money okay so you need to be you need to do a proper planning before you initiate any any project um, okay the second reason is some of the some of my core business strategies depends on a project for example the one of the core strategy for this year for my company is to invest in online sales okay but in order to you know in start online sales i first need to do a setup i need to do a website i need to upgrade my systems all those things so until and unless i set up the online stuff i won't be able to initiate my strategy of having online sales so projects are very very important for businesses okay so now something which is important uh, obviously then uh the board needs to make sure that all projects are controlled properly um just give me a second guys i'm struggling with my marker okay now it's okay, okay. so there are there is proper project management steps which needs to be followed you you just can't you you need to control a project in a disciplined and a structured manner otherwise the project will go haphazard it will go out of control and in the end you will realize that, that the project was a big flop loss of money loss of time and loss of efforts okay so what are the key project management steps <coughs> first of all there has to be a formal project initiation document duly approved by the board extremely critical step because project involve extra money 
extra resources, they require money, resources, time and effort. You just cannot start a project without approval. So normally most of the projects or at least projects which are larger in size are first needs a board's approval. So once the board approves a project, then it can you know initiate and move into the execution phase. So the first and foremost step uh, required in a good project management approach is the initial approval. And uh, the document is called project initiation document. This document is submitted to the board of directors. They read the project initiation document thoroughly. If they have questions, they will ask. And then if they think that the project is worthwhile, if they think that the benefits stated in the project initiation document is worth the risk and time and investment, they would approve the project. Otherwise, they will reject the project. So in case they approve the project, the project will move further into the next stage. And in case the directors reject the project, the project will immediately be finished and shelved. Okay, do you understand the high level concept? Now, let me look at any questions you guys have. Sir, can the CEO and his management approve a PID? It, it actually depends on the size value nature of the project and what kind of authority the board has delegated to the ceo but generally important projects or projects above a certain monetary monetary threshold cannot be approved by the ceo how is pid different from a business case i will cover that in the formats how do we solve a question that talks about tracking project variables i will talk about that Sir, who made the PID? Very good question. I will answer that. So, okay. Relevant questions, but I will answer at the right time. Actually, I'm struggling with my electronic pen. This is distracting me. So if you just give me a minute or so, uh, I'll try and fix it. Just give me a minute. All right, so once the project gets approved and you know the contents of a PID is a very important topic which we will do in a little bit. So supposing once the project gets approved then it goes into the next phase which is called detailed planning for each task. Okay, so obviously in the first stage we just look at high level things, high level aspects of the project, which is required to decide, uh, approve or reject the project. Once the project is approved, then only we go into detailed planning for each task within the project. After the detailed planning, the third stage is implementation. So we look at the detailed plan and we execute so that's implementation. During implementation, there is regular progress monitoring of the project to see how the progress is monitoring in terms of timelines, in terms of uh, quality, in terms of costs. Once the project is done, it is then tested and then it is handed over to the intended users okay pretty uh, common sense thing that first there is initial approval after that there is detailed planning then execution or implementation and uh, throughout there will be regular progress monitoring once the project is completed a thorough testing is done and then the project is handed over to the users okay now there are two very important documents which are prepared after the project is handed over to the users. 
So actually, there are the first important document is a PID. That's the first important document, and then second important document, third important document. There are several documents here as well, like a project plan progress report. But let's skip that for the time being. The important wise one, PID two and three. So a post project review is a document in which we analyze whether the project followed the project management steps simple that's it we just try and see whether the whether all the these steps all the discipline all the steps mentioned under project management framework were those properly followed or not and the reason to see that is lessons learned uh, what went wrong during the project management phase so that in next projects we are able to do better planning and better management okay you can see here it says how the project was managed means that all these steps were followed or not the second important report is called post implementation review now this is a very important book this actually assesses whether the project was successful or failure okay so can anybody tell me how can we judge whether the project is successful or whether the project is a failure i repeat my question how can we judge once the project is completed and handed over how can we judge whether the project was successful or it was a failure oh very good did it meet the objectives effects on the profits and comparing actual results with planned or expected results target is met or not excellent excellent impressive guys very good so it you know completing a project on time or on cost that's a small thing the first thing is why the project was undertaken in the first place so in the pid the initial document the benefits the objective of the uh, um, project the purpose of the project and more importantly the future benefits have were must have been defined that if we undertake this project now this will result in higher revenues or higher profitability in futures so all that benefits would have been clearly spelled out in the initiation document so how do we make sure whether the project is successful or not so then we start comparing actuals versus budget so budget comes from here actual comes from the actual results and if the if the you know if the revenues the actual incremental revenues the actual incremental profits actual benefits are in line with the promised benefits in the initiation document then we will say the project is successful so if so in summary a project a post implementation review is a is a very important review because based on this we decide whether the project was successful or a failure okay right let me look at the questions yes this is post implementation review okay now when we track a project okay how do we track a project from start so a project starts and it goes and then after let's say three years 
or one year or eight years, depending on the duration of the project, eventually it ends. So during this phase, start from start till end, how do you track the project? How do you monitor the progress? Okay. So basically always remember that a project has three legs. How many legs? Three legs. So I have seen two leg creatures. I have seen four leg creatures, but I don't think I have seen a three leg creature except projects. So always remember by this stupid joke that the project has three legs. It stands on three legs. The first leg is quality. The second leg leg is timelines or duration. And the third leg is cost. It's like a tripod. Okay. Those of you on a have studied science, it's a tripod. So now, if we want to track the project tightly or properly, we need to track three things. We need to track the quality aspects of the project. We need to track the timeline or duration. And we need to track the costs of the project. So the question if says, what are the key variables or how the board can track the key variables of any project? You will say that the three most important key variables of project is quality, time and cost. And then you will under each of them, you will explain in the context of the case, how the quality is progressing, how the timeline is doing and how the cost is behaving. Okay, the, the interesting thing here is, or the, these three legs, quality, time, and cost, they are most of the time mutually exclusive. Means that if you want to improve the quality of the thing you are constructing, then obviously time will go up and cost will go up. If you want to reduce the time, then you have to compromise on the quality and, you know, cost, I don't know. If you want to reduce the cost, then you need to reduce the quality of the, you know, project and reduce the time. So they are basically mutually exclusive. So that's why the board really needs to focus on the quality time and cost to tightly control the project variables, okay? Let me take questions before I move to the last thing. How would we track quality? It seems subjective. Okay, Zafar, uh, I have used the word quality, but in the real life, let's say the project is about the construction of a factory. So there will be milestones, there will be certain steps, you know, building, uh, digging the foundation, uh, the construction, the buildings and installing the plant and machinery. So all these are tangible things. So, the, so in real life, you can actually drag the milestones uh, of your major activity of the project. That's what I meant by quality, okay? Are these constraints of the project? No, these are not constraints. Con constraints are human resource, financial resource, and all those things. I will talk about it. All right. So now gets, so in the exam, there was two, two questions so far. One, one, one was on, tracking project variables so if you would have used the word quality time and cost in your answer and written like four or five lines for time four or five lines on quality and linking from the case and there was information in the case it, you would have scored full marks the second type of question which has been asked a couple of time is 
about the PID, the contents of a PID. So here is a list of contents of a PID, but I will hide it for a few minutes, okay? Now I want you to think, as I said, that project involves big money, big resources. There are risks associated with the projects, right? That is why large and important projects the, are always approved by the board before they are in, you know, executed, correct? Now imagine that you are sitting on the board of directors. You are the CFO or the finance director or even a non-executive director. Now you are sitting on the board and someone is proposing a project of $1 million. Okay. The project would require initial outlay or initial cost of $1 million. So it's a serious project. And they are now seeking your approval. They want you to take a look at the project and give them approval to proceed and sign off on a $1 million cash for them. Okay. Now you being a director, what kind of basic information would you expect or would you require about the project to help you understand and help you decide whether you should approve the project or reject the project. So think of three, four, five basic items you would want to see in a project initiation document so that you can decide to give approval or to reject. 10 seconds. Think of three, four, five items as much as you can. Payback period, okay. Benefits, okay. Project objectives, NPV, time, constraints, benefits, scope, cost benefit analysis, risk assessments, time, stakeholders, very good. Purpose, I'm just reading quickly your comments. Resources, uh, benefits exceed the costs, rec risks, reputation, objective, team, scope, time frame morale, constraints, returns, cost, value addition, stakeholders. Excellent, guys. Excellent. Monitoring. That's a good one. Monitoring, Sudhir, is a good one. No, Sara. Human resource, review plus monitoring, risk, quality. Excellent. So now let me show you the list. What are the contents of a PA? First of all, I would expect to see a clear, defined scope and objective what is the purpose of the project why we gonna do this project what it's how it's gonna benefit us as a company after that i want to see a crisp cost benefit analysis i want to see the uh, you see the total costs involved and after that, once the project is complete and up and about, what will be the incremental benefits which we will realize in future years? So I want to see a proper cost and benefit analysis. And maybe from that, I will calculate my NPVs, my IRRs, because if it's a long term, multi year, my paybacks. So all feasibilities, all these technical, not technical, financial analysis, financial profitability, rate of returns, all this I want to see. Okay. Then I want to see who are the key stakeholders. Stakeholders are people who are either, you know, are affected by the project or involved in the project or interested in the project. So the first, there are two types of stakeholders. There will be internal stakeholders and external. So I think this list is internal. And this list is a list of external stakeholders. Okay. So first of all, who is a project sponsor? It, the, the project sponsor has to be clearly defined in the project initiation document. Who is the project sponsor so sponsor means who is the person who is 
responsible or answerable so generally students they think that the sponsor would be the uh, the the company itself because it is financing or sponsoring the project that's true but that's very high level right who in the company so normally one of the executive director becomes the sponsor so it all depends in on the type of the project so if it's a finance related project whom do you think will be responsible so if it's a finance related project then finance director or the cfo would be the most appropriate person because he will be the person who leads the finance department and because it is a finance related project who other than the finance director is the best oh no not hassan dosani finance director <laughs> thank you kamran good one all right so if it's a marketing project like it's a website project for marketing and revenues then maybe the marketing director or the sales director will become the sponsor so he is a person who is ultimately responsible and answerable to the board so this is the person who is actually proposing the project to the board so the question is someone asked uh, before who prepares the project initiation document so it is being prepared by the person who is proposing the project who is owning the project who will be answerable or interested in the project it is being prepared by the sponsor the project is the baby of the sponsor okay so it's very important that the sponsor should be identified at the outset then the, the second most important person is a project manager that who will be the project manager of this project normally we want a full time project manager a part time project manager it doesn't work then third aspect which should be covered is project team okay so sponsor project manager project team against uh, project team it's important that it should be a full time team and then users or concerned department normally you know which department will be using who is the main beneficiary of in case of a software if it's a marketing software then if it's a inventory software then inventory department will be the user okay so these are mostly internal stakeholders the sponsor the manager the team now there could be you know certain projects might have might affect your customers like an online project online sales project a website or transaction online revenue or online ordering systems they affect customers so a customer will be your key stakeholders sometimes a project can affect your suppliers for example you are doing a just in time or you are integrating your system with your suppliers sometimes the project can affect the government okay for example vat or taxes or e filing or e reporting i don't know sometimes the project can affect society like if you are building a a road or a factory it can affect society so main thing is that all the key stakeholders whether internal and external they should be appropriately identified in the project initiation document after that we will talk the i would like to know the duration or timelines of the project what's the deadline how long will the project run i would like to know any major risks associated with the project so whenever we talk about risks just keep in mind the three legs quality the risk that the quality might the requirements or quality might not be met the risk that the project might overrun its timeline and the risk that the project might overrun the costs okay and after risk we talk about any major constraints constraints just keep in mind you can talk about 
human resource or expertise, financial resource, technical resource. And lastly, project governance and monitoring procedures that how the project will be governed, who will govern the, or the, uh, the project, will the full board of directors will be governing the project progress or does uh, does is there a small committee or group to which the board has delegated the monitoring and governance aspects what will be the frequency of the progress reports monthly quarterly so all these comes under project governance and monitoring procedures so can you count for me how many items scope cost stakeholders duration risk constraints projects seven items okay but in this uh, so do i have any questions on what about assumptions yes sometimes in a there are key assumptions so you can also insert key assumptions in a pid should a PID in that order? Generally, yes, but not hard and fast. That's a logical order, right? You start with objectives, then you look at costs, benefits, stakeholders, risk, constraints. Business case is I will cover business case tomorrow uh, in the format. Main document is a PID, okay? Project outputs may be one of the contents. Yes, you can. I mean, you can add whatever contents you want. Okay, there is no hard and fast format of a PID. It depends from company to company. It depends from nature to nature of the projects. I've, I'm just trying to give you a very basic PID from exam point of view. Okay, I don't want you to add a lot of extra stuff because you guys are not doing a PhD in project management you just gonna give uh, sbl exam so my format is just the bare basics from an exam point of view a business case is something different a business case justifies the project it kind of analyzes the current situation or problem then it talks about the possible options and then he evaluates the pros and cons of the options okay that is another document, but it is related. And then a PID is actually a more detailed and a more specific document to uh, for any particular project. Right, so let's do a question on PID. Uh, wait a second. Project initiation documents, SBL specimen number two, rail co, question number five B, the format required. Oh, so we had seven items. Here we have 10 items. How come? Why we have 10 items? The scope and objective, cost and benefit. Ah, the sponsor is a third item, then manager, team, and then other than that, I've mentioned like key to these key stakeholders. So this was one, okay. Duration, risk, constraint, governance, and monitoring. Okay, it's very similar except for that in this format, I have broken up into four items, okay. Professional skills is communication. That's thus format and your layman simple English language. So let's go for specimen two, question number five B. We have exactly 30 minutes. I think we will be able to do that before that. I go back. Specimen. Which one is this? Specimen one? No. I want specimen two. Refresh. Specimen one, specimen two, this one. Start. 
Ah, so you see when you will start the paper, now listen very carefully, the CBE guys, when in the exam platform and you will start the paper, the paper will not immediately appear. It will first, you know, there will be some instruction, some introduction. So you just press, press next here. You see the next at the right bottom, you press next, 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 next 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 he says you have not yet viewed the entire screen scroll down okay so i scroll down i go to the end okay okay next next okay you have not screw viewed the entire screen okay i'll go down next are you begin to ready uh, begin to are you ready to begin your exam yes and then you will reach your paper, okay? Sometimes if the next doesn't work, you need to scroll down and then it will allow you to go to the next paper. Whoa, 5B, so let me click on question requirement five. It says, Produce a project initiation document which could be used by Railco to assist in planning the implementation of an online ticket system. So we need to produce a PID of eight marks and then there is two marks for communication skills of PIDs or ten marks. Okay. So can we quickly first make the format of a PID? I will open a word processor. I will draw a table. Do you remember table here? I click on table. I need two columns and several rows like this. I will write here. Oops, no. I will first give the heading task. 5. We always remember to give the headings because all your questions are supposed to be done in the same word document. Okay, there is no separate document for each question. So don't ever forget to give the question number. Otherwise, the examiner won't know where you are starting and where you are ending the question. You will give the heading project initiation document. You will select, you will center, you will give heading one, underline. Okay, now after that, I will insert the table, table, two columns, several, two columns, several rows. I will write here, uh, no, I will just write here scope slash objective what else cost and benefit sponsor project manager project team duration uh, key risks, constraints, governance, and monitoring. So these are the standard minimum items in a project document. I will resize the column. I will just drag it and bring it here. Maybe I select all and change the format to paragraph heading 3 uh, so that it becomes a bigger more openness is there from a presentation point of view okay all right maybe i just select this column and make it paragraph 3 yeah so now now format is ready let's read the background 
So you are a project manager working for the director of projects and infrastructure of railroad. Okay, got it. I will highlight it. That's my role. And whom do I work for? Director of projects and infrastructure of railroad. So I'm also an employee of railroad. The director of projects and infrastructure is putting forward a proposal to the board of directors of Railco for a project to invest in an online ticket sales system. So what is the project for? It's a project to invest in a online ticket sales system. The project should be fully operational within 12 months. Okay. Another important information. But would need to be undertaken by an external firms of developers as Railco does not possess the internal expertise. So who will be like, you know, do running this project? external team of developers however railco would manage the project so it we will manage but the team will be outsourced like from external firms very interesting so now with this limited information can i try and make the bid so the first one is it says uh, the project is a project to invest in an online ticket sales system where can i copy this where can i fit this can it go under cost benefit objective yes that's the high level objective what is the project about it's a project a capital to invest in an online ticket sales system no fancy stories full stop. now we need to talk about costs and benefits so they haven't mentioned the the costs and benefits um i don't have any numbers here okay in fact, I think we no, we haven't done this question in detail. Okay. So what will be so if you don't have any information, can you just give a general idea of what would be the costs associated with a online ticket sales system? If you want to implement a online, so just as a background, it is a real company of that country, and currently they have physical ticket booths at the stations they don't have as passengers cannot book an online ticket at all okay because of that uh, you know there is a lot of fraud happening because the passengers who, who are in a hurry they don't want to stand in queues or in lines to buy the physical ticket they just uh, get on the train without tickets and then the company feels that if we offer online tickets options, then customers will buy tickets. So because right now they don't offer online uh, ticket buying system, there's a lot of fraud or can I say revenue leakages in the sense that customers are not buying tickets and just riding the trains for free. That's the background. So now we, they want to implement an online ticket sales system so there will be a hardware costs correct you need larger servers and etc there will be a website development costs right we might need to upgrade our it department because you know now we have an online system upgrade it department maybe we need some uh, i think it's enough how about some benefits so listen, I don't want the benefits which are non-monetary. When we talk about this section, cost and benefit, it has to be monetary benefits so that you're able to calculate the NPVs, the IRRs, the paybacks. 
So benefit would be uh, incremental revenues, okay? Because in the case it says that because of lack of online, they are losing revenues. Kalas. I can underline just to you know look it make it look more attractive. Now, who, who should be the sponsor of this project? I had mentioned during my lecture that the sponsor is a senior person, mainly the director level person. So do you see any director mentioned in the exhibit? Okay, as simple as that. Uh, D capital, okay, so I'll go a uh, director of projects and infrastructure of railco no need because it is an internal document so that should be the sponsor now who's the manager you are the project manager so what will you write here what's your name you will write you okay. or you will write me i don't know what you will write Interesting. Project manager, maybe myself, SBL student. I don't know. But now, project team, what information is given on the project team? It would be would be need to be would need to be undertaken by an external form of developers as we do not possess internal expertise. Control C, put it here. Project team will be uh, project will be undertaken by an external form of developers as we do not possess the internal expertise duration 12 months key risks Okay, so can you think of something? What can go wrong with the software? Uh, maybe security, maybe it's not user friendly. Uh, the software, just write anything. Software may not. be able to fulfill all customer requirements i don't know that's a possibility timeline the project may overrun how many months what's the duration 12 months the project may overrun 12 months what's the cost risk the project may exceed the cost budget approved by the board. That's it. <coughs> Constraints. Um, we need to talk about human resource or expertise, financial resources. <coughs> If you don't, if you can't, uh, you know, write anything, just leave the heading here and move on. No problem. Why? Because the examiner has not provided relevant information. So I just demonstrated to him that I know constraints and under constraints, I would have covered human resource or expertise or financial resources constraints. But because the information is not there, I'm not putting anything. Governance and monitoring. The it's a one-year project, right? The 
rail po board of directors should monitor the project on a monthly basis because if it's a quad if it's a short project right so if you suggest quarterly monitoring it's too less so it, since it's a 12 months project i would suggest uh, it can be monitored on a monthly basis or bi-monthly bi-monthly means twice in once in two months okay so that's it let me show you how it looks wow good job Hassan. excellent ten marks i can easily give you seven marks if you've done like this professional marks is for communication so communication means the nice format a professional format so i can bet this is a very nicely driven format and um, another thing is that you need the language should not be technical it should be suitable so that the entire board of directors can understand so i've deliberately used a very simple language so i think i can score seven out of ten on this any questions Okay, board should ask from the sponsor. Yes. <laughs> okay. The key stakeholders. Oh, yes. Key stakeholders heading is missing. Excellent, guys. Excellent, guys. I, I think I need to. Oh, how do I add a row? I want to insert key stakeholders after the team. So I select this row. I right click, I go to row, and I say insert row before. Okay. You see, I got a row. I will write key. So, who do you think are key stakeholders? Uh, maybe the passengers. Maybe the rail board. Okay, that's fine. Just putting a couple of stuff. Thank you for that. Uh, key stakeholders, customers. Uh, in this cust in case they call their customers passengers. Okay, so I want to stick with the word government. A human or a finance. A human resource constraint means that you might struggle to find relevant uh, staff or relevant experts needed for the project. So in this case, they already said that they will, you know, engage a firm of external consultants. A financial constraint would be that how you will, how the company will arrange the investment, the money required for a project. Will they take loans or will they be internally generated? Is there a cost of capital? That's a constraint. Okay. Right. Now, uh, I want, since we have 10 more minutes, let's do one quick question on, a re this is a specimen paper. So, let's do one question, let me remember, was it a, September, go for okay. So this question I'm just doing extra because we have time and this will actually test your knowledge. I will go to past exam. I'm looking for some timber. This one. So in this question, they already gave you a PID in one of the exhibits. Let me zoom this. So in September 2018, they gave you a PID. And they said that this PID was prepared by a junior staff. 
and since now you have joined and now you are the project manager so you are now reviewing the this contents of this pid and you need to identify you know critically critically evaluate critically evaluate means you need to find out the negative things so they said that try at least let us know what things are missing from this pid so take one minute recall the seven items or 10 items or 11 items whatever we discussed and see what items or elements are missing from this pid so this pid was prepared by a junior staff so you are the project manager and you are reviewing the pid prepared by your staff and you're supposed to identify gaps and weaknesses one minute and let me know at least three missing items from the checklist very good very good excellent guys i think you are on top of this topic i'm impressed well done okay so first of all i would i want to see uh, objective or scope do i see objective or scope project aims and background introduction fine background fine business case financial budget time risk so where is the scope and objective i don't this needs to be specifically there called something called scope and objective what is the bloody objective of the project i don't see that so the first thing i will shoot that <laughs> i will shoot that subordinate who prepared this pid i will tell him you idiot where is the project scope and objective and i will throw this on his face and i will pull his hair and i will throw him out of the window okay right scope and objective is missing then i want to see cost and benefits and feasibilities so yes he's included a business case which covers the benefits and costs and progress payments all right it sounds okay to me then i want to see the sponsor okay is the heading of sponsor is there then i want to see the project manager it's there then i want to see the project team i don't see the t so i will again snatch his hairs and slap him and i will tell him where the hell is project team and after that stakeholders where are the key stakeholders i don't see that heading i will i will kill that guy and after key stakeholders uh, i know for for a fact that this in this project the key stakeholders are passengers the government all those things eh? okay uh, risks oh there's a heading called risk excellent and constraints okay the time and cost constant fine i'm happy i don't see the word quality but at least constraints are there so that's it but the bad news is ladies and gents the question was to critically evaluate the pid and recommend what needs to be done so obviously if you are saying the scope and objective is missing then you need to draft a scope and objective and tell that stupid burger that this is how you need to draft and insert. If the timeline is missing, uh, project team is missing, then you need to draft a certain one line or two line about 
project team and tell him this is how it should, should be done. So there's a recommendation involved as well. Okay. Right, guys. Very nice. So we are done with project. Mostly the PID. Do we need to explain what is scope and objective? Ria, I will kill you. Do you need to explain to the board of directors what is a objective scope? No definitions. Okay, you just you just draft a scope and objective of this particular project. Okay, please change your mindset. That is why you you know majority people fail because they go theoretic. An examiner doesn't give marks for theoretic or explanation, general explanations. Now, if you remember, like there are four more minutes. So if you remember yesterday's lecture, I told you that there are two types of exhibits. Remember, there is a one-to-one -one exhibit and there is one is too many. And in the first one hour, we cannot read all the exhibits so which exhibits we will read first we will read one is too many exhibits first okay so then the next question is how do we identify one is too many exhibits so there are certain types of exhibits which are generally one is too many like uh, board meeting minutes so all you know, generally the board meeting minutes are one is too many annual reports website page transcript of an interview uh, maybe press releases so 70 80 percent of the time these particular exhibits are one is too many meaning that they contain information a variety of information which is supposed to be used in more than one question and then what are the hints about one is to one exhibits they are mostly financial statements financial projections uh, any weird specific topic it's one is to one so now let's try and guess so here the exhibit Overview is overview. Then the next item is extracts from most recent annual report. I'll try and open it. Okay, so this is a chief executive statement. So annual report obviously will come consist of variety of information and you can also judge from the length of the exhibit, the headings board, the audit committees, the risk. It is definitely a one to one or one to many. Let me know. Very good. Very good. Let's look at this one. Press release announcing the new road. By the name of it, although it's a press release, but it says announcing the new road. So it's it's got to be a specific thing, and I think the size would be small. If you look at the size, what do you think? One is to one or one is to many? Yeah. So I will skip that. When I'm reading, I will read the overview. After that, I will read the extracts. After that, I will skip this. I will just take a 30 seconds look. Just look at it for 30 seconds. Announcing new road between G and Lake Eta. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, we have identified a preferred partner, low price, da, 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 end. Okay, class. So I will skip it. Now look at this forecast revenue and cost for new road. So financial projections forecast this and that generally is what one is too many, right? One is too many forecast revenue. No, say yes or no. One is too many. Yeah, let's have a look at it. 
So it is just a very specific, specialized financial thing, right? So I will just pick this up. I will skip this for the time. No, not. I will just take a quick look for 30 seconds. I don't want to go blind by not looking. 30 seconds, progress payments. It tells me about progress payments. Then there is a heading called, I'll just take a look at the headings. Projected costs, years, total, the cost is there. Whatever, that's it. Okay, I'll skip it. One, two, one. Outline contents of a PID. So, you know, again, it sounds very specific that it is telling me the contents of a PID. So it can only be used in a question relating to project management or PID. Right? So I expect it to be one is to one. I will skip. Then transcript of an emergency meeting. And this meeting is between who and who? So this meeting is between uh, the chief executive, the chairman, the risk manager, and the consultant. So what do you think? One is to one or one is too many? So meetings, board meetings, and all those are generally one is too many. Okay, board meetings. So there is not the board here, but at least the chairman is there, the chief executive there, like four people are there. It's an emergency meeting. It looks, look at the size. So generally one is too many are lengthy exhibits. Okay, so I would read this one because I know it's a one is too many. And then report interview with Burton Vader. It's an interview with the CEO. But looking at the size, I would imagine it's a one is to one. Big data. Okay, that's a one is to one. So in this case, I can see that annual report. This one is one is too many. and transcript of emergency meeting so there are two one is too many i will read these two first and then i will move to the smaller ones okay so with this ladies and gents i would try i would now uh, wrap up tonight's session and uh, please remember tomorrow is the last day and i would be disclosing and discussing a lot of important stuff for tomorrow including uh, uh, important topics for last moment revision list of practice questions i will discuss the technical articles of blockchain and cryptocurrencies i will then recap all the formats recap all the professional marks and then i will take you know i will give more time to your questions so please uh, do not miss tomorrow and uh, till then um, take care and good night